I received some criticism about the podcast in the past week in the form of what should have been a multi-paragraph rant, but actually was just one long paragraph, indicating that I demonstrated aspects of narcissism and that I had all sorts of problems with the podcast that needed to be addressed. Among them was a focus on myself. So taking those criticisms to heart, I've decided to talk about myself straight for about 25 minutes. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Dan Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been helping me get out of debt. It's the 42nd episode. I figure that would be a good time to talk a little bit about my personal philosophies and life outlook, especially as regards my public persona and how I approach the things that I do in my life. I am definitely a different person across my life. I have certain traits that have existed since my childhood, but also I have, I like to think, improved in some areas and perhaps given up others. There's certainly a different outlook that comes out of me after my parents' divorce, after I leave my father's home to go to college in Boston, uh, after I'm married, after I get married, after I get divorced, after I joined the archive, and certainly after I had my heart attack. All of the things in our lives contribute to what we are, and that is something that just represents living. And so, laying it out as well as I can at the age of 48, here's a little bit of what I've learned about living and what I think I know about the way I live my life. I have been the webmaster for a notorious website. I've been a writer for an even more notorious website. I've been a Unix administrator, and I've been somebody who's done all sorts of hacker con things, from speaking at them to doing a documentary about one. And in 2011, I became a full-time archivist after doing it essentially as a hobby for most of my life before then. So I've worn all sorts of different hats, and if I have to get to the root of all of it, I've always had a strong desire to take what I've learned about the world, or tricks, or information that I've gathered, and share them as widely as possible, whether by myself, using machines, or passing it on to people who I think will share it even further. Everything seems to go back to that. Collecting all of those text files from bulletin board systems in the 1980s, my first urge was to put together a showcase for them. It initially started out as some floppy disks, but eventually became its own bulletin board system, the works. When I had gathered them to the point of having enough to make a website out of them, I made textfiles.com. When I was worried about bulletin board systems being lost in the loam of the past, I went and spent four years making a documentary. And when I worked in the games industry, I worked at the help desk. I wrote hint books. I helped people on the phone eight or nine hours a day to understand how their computers worked and to make things better for them by giving information. I suppose this podcast could have been one of any number of subjects and different approaches, whether it was interviews or doing travel logs or perhaps just doing straight, dry, historical paragraphs. But I felt that I wanted to wrap a life inside of what this technology was. I could tell you when the pet computer was created. I could tell you about the people who designed it, who worked on it, what it represents for the company that made it, where its part is in computer history. But I find it's a little more meaningful to describe how it affected me as my first computer and what my feelings were and to share those feelings and thoughts that I had along with a sense of fun about the whole endeavor. I mean, I still have the Commodore Pet that I first used in a storage unit just a little way down the road from where I live. Obviously, 
having this computer, this piece of technology, this toy, this tool in my life affected me for the rest of my life. There was a program on it, Hunt the Wumpus, one of the classic early text games where you were presented with a maze and told that in each case you were in a room that had multiple other doors and you would be given a hint that there were things like arrows and pits and some sort of creature called the wumpus and you were trying to escape. It was a matter of typing in the right door numbers and making your way out. Well, I discovered that it was in BASIC. It was in this text language that I could sort of understand. I had no computer training, and I had no book to read at that time, but I figured out that I could change the strings so that the wumpus did awful things, the kind of things a 10-year-old would want a wumpus to do, to have a pit that makes a mention of being disgusting or have bats meow. It was a sense of power to know that if I reached into this code, that if I went backstage and I added a little bit of myself, the computer would not just allow it, but it would trumpet it to the hills. I could have other people sit down and play my variation, my mod of this game. You see, I could describe Hunt the Wumpus in a way that you could get from any entry on the internet. But I've shared a little bit of what made me myself in the hope that people perhaps would see themselves reflected in it. Which brings me to another philosophy, vulnerability. It's so easy to be brusque online, to come off as courageous and unflappable and to have no downtime and to turn your online persona into a performative work in which things never go bad or if they go bad they only go bad in dramatic ways that have beautiful snapbacks in in no time and in the last probably decade or so i've really strived honestly strived to share vulnerability that I experience. There are moments when I feel utterly terrible. There are moments when uh, some level of sadness or hopelessness or fear overcomes my ability to get things done. And, and I share that because I'm concerned that people will think that being a human being inherently, with its ups and downs, is some sort of failure that they don't have within themselves the same thing they see in people they admire. You know, there are people I've met with incredible energy, and everything about them seems wonderful, but over time you'll realize that they have dark days, they have days when they don't want to deal with people or they feel terrible, but they might not be inclined to share them. Similarly, you might find people who seem to never catch a break, who aren't happy ever, for everything they see is a terrible moment, and there's just no joy in their lives. But again, I'll meet these people, and actually, when they enjoy things, they drop away from online. When they go for a walk or have a great meal or spend an afternoon with a friend, they're not overcome with a need to talk about it online. They don't turn it into an Instagram gallery or make it into a Twitter stream. Instead, they just enjoy it. It's only when they want to dump things out that they'll go to Facebook or Twitter or just kind of drop it there. So it cuts both ways. Online life, I've come to believe, is a reflection, but it's a reflection that warps. It's a reflection that encourages you to warp it, to fashion a new character for yourself. When I was doing the BBS documentary, 
what I would do is meet somebody who had never been interviewed before. And I would sit down with them and I'd have to read the room. I'd have to see if they were excited to tell a story or if they were a little bit nervous. And now that a person with a camera was there, was this such a great idea? Did they really want to be a part of this? If I thought they were skeptical or nervous, I would have a prepared speech for them in which I said that I never wanted anybody who was in one of my documentaries to regret ever sitting with me for an interview. I wanted it that when they saw the final movie, even if they were in it a little or a lot, they felt that they had contributed to something meaningful, and I had brought out what was informative and interesting about the bulletin board system history they played a part in. On the whole, I think I did it. I'm still friends with people from that time. There are people who are happy to bump into me at various events who were in the documentary way back when. And I guess that extended to a lot of other things. I, I wanted to help people. I didn't want to leave behind bitterness and regrets. I built the textfiles.com website so that you could go in and you would see stacks upon stacks of text files and feel like you had stumbled onto some incredible library that had been collected meticulously because it had, and yet you could go on your own journey, your own pace. I might be there to help you, or I might have left some breadcrumbs, but it was your time there. I didn't make it about having to go through a paywall or force you in one direction or limit things and make people have to get them in drips and drabs. I made it that you could download the entire site and take it away. And, and it was only natural that I would eventually go to work for a place that had that exact philosophy baked into everything. To be able to get millions of files from the Internet Archive Immediately, that's the core ethic of that place. It is, and has been for many years, an endless giveaway that doesn't judge you and only wants you to find your own way and your own happiness. So the heart attack changed a few things about how I was working and what my priorities were. One of the first things it did was cause me to take an assessment of what I was working on and what mattered to me and what I wanted. So the first thing I realized was that I'd been keeping a lot of things in trust. If there was a pie chart of my possessions, 90% of my things were not, in the strictest sense, mine. They were something for others. They were in need of being digitized or donated or assessed or photographed or displayed. They weren't really for me. I had dozens of certain kinds of computers. I had dozens of screens, thousands of floppy disks, many CDs, tons of magazines, and all sorts of electronic parts that just represented my concern throughout the 2000s that things were going to disappear and never be found again. And after the heart attack, I realized that was not the life I needed to be living. So I gave it away to the appropriate places and people and things as well as I knew. And as a result, my life became much lighter. This is causing me now to focus on what's left and each time dig deeper, scoop further out from a pit of commitments to ensure that, here it is, by the time I'm 50, I will have no commitments that I gave myself before I was 50. I've got a little less than two years to do it. I have a few different projects that are promised people. I have a few piles of things that need ingestion. I have a whole range of emails from folks about long-term ideas that I need to either finish or hand off. I want it that at 50, I turn and I'm able to ask myself, what do you want? Instead of saying to myself, what are you doing? I've been focused on getting healthier, having more energy, 
making it that if things attract me or I want to be part of things, that my energy level is such that I want to be involved. I registered to vote today, and at the bottom of the paper, it asked me if I wanted to be a poll official, and I do. So I checked it off, and when I hand-delivered the voter registration to make sure that it went in, I talked to the person, and apparently I'll be taking a short class and sitting in the polls on that day. I wanted to be a part of something that I thought was important, and I felt I had the energy to do it. There might have been a time in my life when I lacked that completely. There was certainly a period right around the end of my college career where one day I just couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't leave my apartment. I just lay in bed, sad. I think this was around, hmm, I guess I was 21, and I was in my senior year of college. And for four weeks, I didn't leave my apartment. I mean, I went out at night to grab something from a store, and that was about it. I just lay in bed, uninterested in things. I just listened to the city outside, and I felt like, well, I don't know what I felt like. I felt maybe that I didn't know what I wanted, and I didn't know what I was, and I had been focused so much on running around trying neat things that I had forgotten what I wanted to be. So somewhere after that, I clawed out, and I haven't really had an episode like that since. I'm not sure if it was just the weight of growing up on my head, or if it was a very specific malady or some other problem, but I often look back to that time. I mean, I was probably in among the best health I was ever going to be. You know, I was 21 years old. I, I, I could do a whole lot, put my body through all sorts of things, and I just lay inert. While I'll never get that time back, I like to think that in the time hence, I've made the most of it. I mean, <laughs> doing the BBS documentary was the single hardest thing I've ever done. I'm never going to do anything like that again. It was years of research. It was years of travel. It was no sleep. It was going through the emotional ups and downs of travel. It was being disconnected from things. And then the triumph, the high of coming out with the finalized project and, and getting it out to thousands of people. It was something that every time I pop it on, which I do maybe, you know, a few times a year now, I'll watch it and I'll be happy that it tells the story that it does. And, and I'll see people in there that I know are now gone. But to do it, I basically woke up in my 30s and told myself, and I'm not exaggerating, I told myself this, this is it. This is the prime time. You are young enough to have the energy. You are old enough to be listened to. And you have the means. Is this project going to be where you push all the chips? And it was, and I don't regret it. So if you're listening and floating in the back of your mind is a project that you think is within your abilities, but really involved and perhaps almost intimidating, let me tell you, jumping after it is so worth it. Even if what comes out the other side isn't what you expected, leaping into something huge in your life, something that is outside of what people think you are or what you can do, is infinitely rewarding. What a delightful grab bag life is. It's full of surprises full of things that you walk around the corner and get knocked over by or go around another corner and get lifted up by. It's, it's raucous parties. It's quiet moments. It's flecks of brilliance sprinkled onto uh, day after day of strangeness. I've also learned it's about the people you love and the people that matter to you being told on a regular basis that you're thinking of them 
and that they've played a part in what you are and you hope you can play a part in what they're going to be. I think at the end of the day, these beautiful machines that have ruined my eyesight and, and, and locked me away in rooms have connected me to folks. But even I know that the million billion words that I've typed out are just one part of a spectrum of wonder that is being alive. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bequianu, Sam Johnston, Adam Green, and Mark Pilgrim, along with the hundreds of other supporters who have been helping me get out of debt. You know, one last piece. I mentioned being criticized at the beginning of this podcast, and I wanted to make clear I get lots of criticism and accolades every day. It doesn't usually come with a goulash of red yarn and, and interrelated ideas, but people are really communicative with me about things they like and things they don't, and it's part of doing something. And, and I would love, if you're a person who's on the edge about doing stuff and worried about feedback, I mean, feedback comes in all forms. People will enjoy the work you do, and some of them just simply won't let you know, while others who don't enjoy it at all will let you know. It's just the nature of doing something that is shared by other people. But if it's something that matters to you, that you think the world needs, let me be among the chorus of voices that tell you it is worth doing. You are worth it. You can do it, and I will wait for the opportunity to see what you do. Oh, one last thing. On October 28th at 2 p.m. at a nightclub in New York City, I'm going to be running a textfiles.com 20th anniversary event. If you follow my Twitter feed, you'll see me link to an event right about it. It's going to be recorded, and I'm going to be having some old friends and new colleagues read from text files. I'll record it. I'll make sure you get to hear it. And it'll be a way of celebrating two decades of wanting to be a positive part of people's lives and histories and telling them about a world that, in some ways, is completely gone. Next week... I'll be switching to subjects people have requested of me. See you then.